You were never the kind to break even. In school, you did not break even. You did better than that. You strove to be in the 80th, 90th percentile all throughout your life. You strove to be on far extremes of whatever distributions, normal distributions were out there. You always wanted to be more. You could, you were never content with mediocrity. And you cannot then allow attrition, persecution, hurt, and the indiscretion of mankind to break you to a point of fearing poverty so much that you will allow people to walk all over your head and basically hold your ideas in your mind and not share them because you're scared of what a person might do because they realize that Lomundlona Usagan Pil because they realize that this person is smart, this person is the gifted better than me. Like, yo, guys, you know what? I was studying full time, mm, sorry, part time. I was studying part time while working, right? On the come up with my career. I never, therefore, was ever in corporate South Africa at any given moment with an actual degree. I was never degreed. I was unruled getting a degree. I was working on it. I had to drop out of school because my mom was not paying my fees. And so I took myself back to Vitz part time. And it took years for me to ultimately get to the point where I was almost graduated. And at the cusp of that graduation, that was ripped the carpet again from underneath my feet. Never mind by sabotage and witchcraft, but also by the loss of everything. At the very end of, of my career, where I was left with literally one module to graduate, boom, everything fell apart and I couldn't finish school. I couldn't finish school. And... So therefore, what I'm trying to highlight with that is that I was never a degreed individual in corporate. Only one unroot getting a degree. And yet, the job promotions that I got, the jobs that I worked, always required a degree. Always, like, <laughs> there, from what point? Not always. The beginning of my career where I was in call centers and stuff like that. There, I didn't need a degree. Matric was enough. And maybe some NQF level 4 um, certification in uh, personal lines, insurance or long-term insurance or wealth in management or whatever. Yeah, I did all that in entry-level jobs. But my first job where I needed a degree, but didn't have one, but got one anyway, was when I was 20... Uh, Two or three? I was 23. Yeah. I was 23 years old. I, had, I was coming from the call center at Nedbank. And I was applying for a training center administrator job. I wanted to get out of the call center. I wanted to get out of the grain of that. A call center can feel really dead end. Uh, it's hard to move anyway. How do I call center? Okay. So I wanted to be in a space where it is that I could now aspire to be bigger more. And so I kept on applying for admin jobs elsewhere in the company that was Nedbank. And of course, I tried to leave Nedbank altogether as an organization. Uh, I just wanted to get out of the call center i just i did not want to be stuck I, I knew of people who had been in the call center for 10 years i was like that um, that's not gonna be my life ever okay again i was never dorisi i'm blowing me in my call center for years i don't blow them in a position that appears dead end for years on air i was never doris i was never i could never be at ease with being doris <laughs> so it's really very it's a travesty that i even thought to be doris all right anyway whatever i applied for a job as a training center administrator still for netbank but at um 100 main right uh, which is another building i was working at brown park at the time they called me after i don't know how many jobs on the intranet i applied for at Nedbank. just applying applying up i just wanted to get out of the call center okay finally they called me and i went for the first interview and then i got shortlisted the second interview that i went to to be an administrator the lady there that was interviewing me this time it was at uh 100 king at what what west in santon the net bank building in santon yeah that's where i was being interviewed i was going to work there uh for this lady if at all i successfully interviewed right and i went to the interview and that woman liked me so much she was so besotted with me that she stopped me she did in the middle of the interview and was like look Karabo, you're so well spoken you're so articulate you are so smart and so um knowledgeable that i feel like it would be just a waste of your skills at this point to put you in this training center administrator job uh how would you like to be a trainer at all that's how i became a facilitator i told you before i ended up working for kijima as a project manager i was a trainer for netbank um and this woman halfway in the not even halfway it was like 15 minutes into the interview 10 minutes in, she was like, would, would, how, how would you much, would, would you much, not much rather interview for this other job, right? The job was for being a trainer, a facilitator, right? Uh, however, not for her. It would be for her colleague because her colleague was looking for trainers uh, in the Pretoria Hatfield branch. And they were interviewing, interviewing to no avail. And she was like, how would you like to be a trainer? My, my colleague would, would love you. And I was like, of course, like, why in the world would I pass that up? I was already very ambitious. I already felt like I was set back by not being able to finish my degree. Uh, I was just, you know, my friends were 
finishing their degrees at adversity or finished and working as interns or graduates in companies and here it is that I was starting in the goal center like a matriculant so I felt already like I was behind I felt like I had missed out on an opportunity to basically be on an academic professional track and uh, that, that starts with graduation type setup thing and somebody gave me a job that required a degree despite not having a degree this woman I had like the, the the women that I was working with in the in this profession in the well though it was women and men but in my particular branch where I worked it was only women um uh, the, the the at 100 main and also in Santon and uh, yeah there were men but where it is that I was at it was just women okay <clears throat> the women that I I worked with they the one of them they were either um like they either had like degrees from the university within the 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 training space like a like bachelor of arts like you know, a very basically art degrees they either had art degrees and loads of work experience like as in i've been working for netbank for 15 years i've been working mind i'm 23 24 i've been working so i've only got like what a couple of years of uh, work experience under my belt the first two years of my um post matric life was spent on campus at university and then i was a um an employee in the entry-level call center jobs in corporate south africa for maybe like a year and a half at that stage yeah and my colleagues were like employees of netbank for when one woman was close to retirement right they had been working at, at netbank for pretty much all of their career 30 years or something uh type establishment thing she had been at netbank the other one was there like 15 years and before uh being at netbank for 15 years she was a teacher she used to teach at a school like a high school right there were two teachers there and one was close to retirement having worked for netbank in the past and was now a trainer yeah do you know what i'm saying yeah those were my colleagues those were my colleagues degreed women with years of work experience and some of them were even in the teaching industry uh in the teaching profession and i rocked up as this kid with no degree and admin call center experience Literally, all I had was call center experience. And just based on an interview alone, this woman was like, um, stop dating your tracks. I feel as if though you would be fit for purpose, ideal to be a trainer. How would you like to be that? And she recommended me to her colleague. And her colleague was like, fine, if you believe in her, I believe in her. And I got interviewed in a couple of, you know, weeks down the line. I was now working that job at NetBank. It was a massive boost in my career. And it was the beginning of a professional, of an academic professional track. Every job that I have had ever since then has required some kind of degree. And yet I got it in spite of not having my degree. They ran with the fact that I was en route getting my degree. Yet to get it, but it doesn't matter because I like you. Every job, like every job that I got since the training center job required a degree and yet they didn't care that I didn't have one. They were just happy that I was studying and that I, and that I was about to acquire one. That, that over there was the favor of God. Like that's what you need to understand. When God has placed you somewhere, the formalities uh, of this world will not matter. The formalities of this world will be irrelevant. You will be qualified by God and not so much by man and man will miraculously disregard their insistence upon your qualifications man will let it slide it will literally go under the carpet and it will not matter so you will be among your colleagues the only one without a degree and the only one without 20 years experience and yet nonetheless on the same job level they may give you less money than your colleagues but in comparison to where you come from it's a lot of money so i don't think i was earning as much as those women um i was definitely earning the least out of all of them but it was a huge boost from where it is that i was before massive it was a gargantuan jump from the call center where i was at at netbank it was more than double it was close to triple what i was earning at that netbank and it was basically the beginning of the end of my financial troubles it would only get much sweeter going forward from there such things kept on happening and happening and happening to me and uh, at the netbank i then the next job that i worked i was a an intern project manager there too they required that you have at a minimum of project management certification of sorts um project management body of knowledge pimbok with a degree the the girl that i told you about that set me up for failure who i gave the name Kahiso. uh you will remember from from uh, an earlier part of this particular conversation she had a uh a, 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 a king was it a bcom or a bsc in statistics yeah from some university in this country and she 
had entered into Gijima through an, an internship, and then she was made permanent from that place. One of the girls, the one of the the, the women that I was working there, the, one of the project managers that I was working there, had a mechanical engineering de- or not was it a chem no sorry chemical engineering degree from this. Like I was working with heavily degreed professionals having nothing but matric yeah nobody like i literally my colleagues have needed to have degrees i was the only one among them at all these given points that did not have many such qualifications i remember at mtn remember i I entered in and my boss the my future boss said that i have to stick around there sorry that uh he will be prepared to give me an opportunity if i'm happy to be an administrator demote and then maybe one day work towards project management he said that i was not sufficiently qualified well i would end up being a program coordinator for um his boss and he also would be my boss right because they were on a on a recruitment drive to get project management managers in and i was an administrator of the boss lady um i sometimes was i was privy to their cvs the cvs of these people that were applying for project management jobs at mtn yo guys when i saw those cvs i was like okay i understand why this man first and foremost did not want to see me and why the two of them duped me into taking a job that i would like twist in the wind in for two years before i would get promoted their experience was out of this world and their degrees their degrees yes like it and i remember this one cv passing it on to my boss when it came from hr and my boss was like no i don't want to see this person i remember just like slumping in my chair on some why is she rejecting the cv it is so good it is that person that person was so highly qualified and had so much experience and they were trying to work for mtn and my boss was like nah i don't want it I couldn't understand why she was passing him up but i mean i was just an administrator i was like okay uh, next 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 and i just kept follow- forwarding cv to- cvs to her when i saw the cvs of these people i understood why my boss was apprehensive to hire me as a project management in the first place but nonetheless two years later i would then end up getting the promotion and yeah and it was yet to become a program manager you had to oh, at mtn anyway they kind of insisted that you have your pmp for you to be a program manager and yet the one new dude rocked up on the team and was like ah, well can you run this program i was like okay i don't have my pmp but it's all good in the hood if you want me to try this i will try it and these opportunities were given me based on nothing but my work ethic what i was able to deliver what they saw me do and what they therefore trusted would be my inevitable delivery when then put on the job and i never disappointed i never disappointed so what i'm trying to uh put out there right now is that the sabotage of my person and the uh, like just a comprehensive pulling of the rug from underneath um my feet was based on the observation of such things as these in spite of being non-degreed albeit unwit getting a degree and in spite of not having as much experience as was necessary for me to do certain jobs i was put in them anyway and i was i was able to rise like quite quickly every job i've ever had i've had to have some kind of a degree some kind of a qualification and the, the even the administration role required um a degree my my friend had a degree like the girl that was working with me had a degree the guy that was with me had a de- they they had degrees i was the only one that was still studying towards mine and yet they gave me the jobs anyway that's what it is under heaven that i have had before and god kept on telling me garabo remember my benefits okay if at all i could do that for you in the past what makes you think that i am not looking out for you now today what happened to you was because my favor was always on your life you had a call on your life you had to do what you needed to do and upon then getting to a certain level you also had to fall out of that grace that glory you had to lose it all for the sake of my kingdom what got you to the place of being recognized in spite of not having earthly credentials was your um work ethic it was your work ethic you you worked and surprisingly god uh, rewarded with recognition that was me i was the wind beneath your wings i'm the one that puts kings in their positions and brings low i am the person that moves to the left moves to the right shifts king elevates upward or brings low it's me nothing and no one but me you therefore cannot based on fear allow yourself to merely exist because of your fear of the unknown of the wicked and because of your fear of what people could potentially do and again you have endured sorcery attacks abuse from witchcraft for a whole decade and you will tell you are going to therefore be inclined to think that people can successfully curse you you are going to be inclined to think that if they could curse you out of a career before they can do it again 
But what you need to realize is that Job was not cursed, and yet he lost uh, everything. David was not cursed, and yet he had to flee his own country. Joseph, I made, did, did I made mention of Joseph. D uh, Job lost everything. Joseph was not cursed. He was blessed, and yet he lost everything. Every last one of the stories of these men, and even women in the Bible. You see my hand of providence in bringing them through using the very sabotage of their persons, evidencing that they were never cursed, just unroot somewhere else. I had to build character in them. That is the nature of patience. When you ask God to build humility in you, when you ask God to build patience in you, when you go to God in prayer and ask for a husband as a woman, and alongside asking for a husband, you then ask that he make you fit for purpose to be a wife. God is going to put you to a journey to give you that answered prayer. When you ask the Lord to be, for instance, a philanthropist, altruistic, like generous, like no man's business, build, building schools, building, uh, uh, establishing careers for people, you know, just snatching people out from poverty and setting them up in their own businesses. If that's what you hope one day to achieve and you come to me in prayer and you ask for that, I'm not going to merely just give you all these wonderful business ideas for you to become a millionaire, billionaire or whatever that you might finally do what it is that you've been wanting to do all along. I am going to give you the kind of character that indeed can handle all that wealth, all that opportunity, all that influence, and rightly steward it, and rightly therefore apportion it to whomever I will have you look at. Because there tends to be little knacks of corruption in those that get made wealthy on the earth, those that get made powerful on the earth, and those that get given the best gifts, they tend to be conceited. That's what the thorn in the flesh is for. If you think about Paul, in the scriptures, he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, and he asked God to remove it three times, and God said no, and said, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. If you think about the explanation for why it is that Paul was kept with that thorn, you will realize how it is that God works with great callings, okay? Paul says that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says that basically prior to him coming to Christ, he was already an awesome guy. He was, he had a lot in his plate. He was regarded. He was respected in society. He was a, a teacher of the law. He was a religious leader that had clout in society. God then calls him to be his servant. And here it is that he is this most important guy in the New Testament. Out here writing the majority of the New Testament with that kind of a big call to reach the Gentiles for Jesus. The branch that will be grafted in according to Romans 11. Paul is responsible for bringing them home. The whole of modern Christendom is literally the work of Paul, the apostle. I am a Christian because of Paul. I'm a Christian because of Christ. I am a Christian even because of all the other apostles. But the work to evangelize the Gentile population, that job was given to Paul. The proliferation of the gospel to nations that are outside of Israel was Paul's initial. He was the one that started that ship, that, that, that car, that ignition was, was by Paul. Paul was the one that then did that, you guys. When you get given that kind of a job where historically, you were already very important. You were important as a sinner. And now you're important as a saint. That can get to a person's head. That is the kind of stuff that can get to a person's head. Well, when I'm lost, I'm the chief of sinners. So I'm the baddest sinner in the game. And I am also very important and loved. And then I become a Christian. And, I beca and, I, and then I become a Christian. And I become the baddest Christian in the game. Like, God has to keep a thorn in the flesh of a person like that, they, that they might not be conceited. And that's what Paul also says, that in order that I might not be conceited, the Lord kept a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, that I might not be conceited. Because why would you not be conceited when God Almighty not only favors you outside of your sinful, outside of Him, when, during the days of your sinful escapades, you were really popular. And now that you are a saint, you are popular in Christendom. You are huge. You are the biggest and baddest dude in these Christian streets. Why would the Lord not severely burden a person like that with something that is going to keep them humble? Why wouldn't he do that? Like Joseph was also similarly that guy. Joseph gloated about his big call in Christ and his brothers threw him into slavery for it. But it was that very slavery that ultimately brought the very promise he was gloating about. Jacob, yet another one. If you think about Jacob, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Jacob was a trickster. In the beginning of his life, he was this shoddy, seedy dude that you would not like because he was into trickery. He was not even the best in terms of earthly morality. Out of the two sons, Esau was frankly the better boy coming up. He was like the teacher's pet, the dude that you would hate because he does so well at everything. Esau was the kid that was the most seemly to inherit a promise. And yet God chose Jacob 
Do you understand? Jacob of which was a whole trickster. He just did not make sense. He was always pulling rugs from underneath people's feet. He was, once he was ultimately given the promise, he still maintained so much of his shoddy disposition that he went on right ahead and favored one son above everybody else so badly that they send him off to be a slave while lying to him saying that he's dead. That was Jacob. So the thorn, the thorns that God put in Jacob's flesh were to keep him humble. Otherwise he would have been conceited. God made war with him all night until his hip broke. He walked around, all right, with a broken hip with a limp. However, having first fought God all night and then he got blessed. When a trickster is to inherit the promise in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He was among those, right? If you're going to inherit something like that, having started your life being a trickster, you're going to be arrogant if you don't get some thorn put in your flesh. The, his first thorn was his limp, the one that he was given for the rest of his life after fighting the angel of God all night. I won't let you go until you bless me. The second thorn in his flesh was in the fact that they gave him the wrong wife and then he had to marry her and then he was given the right one after working another seven years to get her. The third thorn in his flesh was the fact that his favorite wife died giving birth to their second child so he was not able to keep the wife around. That was dealing with his conceitedness. And then the final thorn in his flesh was in the fact that his favorite son, that he was out of prancing and gloating in front of everybody, was um, believed dead by him. And he had to mourn that death for the rest of, for, for not the rest of his life, sorry, but because he ultimately did get to see Joseph again. But he had to mourn the death of a son that was alive. The fifth thorn in his flesh was the fact that he found out when he was an old man that his sons lied to him. So basically the discovery that his favoring of the one son caused him to lose all the benefits of being a dad to that one boy up until he found out that his boys tricked him his sons tricked him into believing that his son was dead mm. all those thorns all those thorns had to be in joseph's flesh jacob's flesh sorry why because he was conceited he would have been conceited if he did not give, get given a thorn in the flesh so what is imperative then to understand what is imperative to understand then is that when the Lord has jam-packed you with a lot of giftedness prior to your born-again life and once you are uh, saved in Christ, then God giving you a big mission too. He will tend to put some kind of humility in you that will just stick. It will just stay there and it's not going to go anywhere. And you are going to make war with it and ask God to remove it and he just won't. Because you don't get to be a Pharisee of Pharisees and a Christian of Christians and not have a thorn in your flesh. You don't get to have your bread buttered on both sides. Human beings, we are born dead in trespasses and sins. In sin did our parents conceive us. We have a propensity towards arrogance and gloating and boasting. So if the Lord does not uh, do something to simmer down the propensity to gloat for somebody like that, what in the world? They're going to go out here bashing their chest on the mountaintop like King Kong saying, I've arrived. Because look at me, when I'm a sinner, I'm the baddest one in the game. And when I'm a saint, I'm still the baddest one in the game. God leaves a thorn in the flesh of people that he has favored loftily before. So sometimes he throws his disciples into excruciating poverty and then recovers them. And once he has recovered them, there tends to also still be maintained in spite of their recovery, some kind of a thorn that they might not be conceited. So Jacob, not Jacob, Joseph, his thorn was being thrown into slavery, then prison. Then he got exalted later on. Manasseh, Potiphar's heart, not Manasseh, a pharaoh's uh, two IC guy, second in charge type establishment thing. Then he had to deal with the fact that his brothers came back. He was always grieved. However, he had to humble himself to recognize that what you intended for evil, the Lord intended it for good, the saving of many lives. There's always just something that God uses to humble those that he gives a very big call, especially when they had a favored life before they fell apart. Joseph had a favored life before he fell apart. Um, Jacob was, was a trickster and favored by his mom before he fell apart. Uh, what do you call this? Uh, David. You will remember the thorn in his flesh. Let's, let's talk about the thorn in David's flesh. The thorn in David's flesh was the fact that after the Bathsheba incident, him thinking that he and him have arrived, all right? Because of his indiscretion with Bathsheba, getting basically his bread buttered on both sides, he got to have the woman that he archered to from another man. He, he got to make her a wife for crying out loud. Coupled with the fact that that wife would be the one to bear the son that would proliferate the promise. It's like you steal a woman and she becomes the one to bear the heir. What in the world? You don't get to keep that. You don't get to just keep that and be content. So this is what's good. God put a thorn in his household in the sense that the sword never left David's household. That was the judgment. First and foremost, Bathsheba lost the first baby. It was miscarried. And then Solomon would then be the baby born next, right? And that would be the, the, the one to proliferate in the lineage. But then all that war that came in David's household was because of the sin that he committed with Bathsheba. 
The sword never left his household. Amnon was raised up to go and ransack and ravage Tamar. Absalom would be mad at David's lack of appropriate response. And then he would kill Amnon, be at enmity with his dad, coup his dad's kingdom, cause his dad to flee from his kingdom or his country yet again, just like what happened in the days of Saul, and then mourn his son when then he gets killed by David's mighty men. That is the thorn that God gives people. So to give up and throw in the towel and be angry at God and allow yourself to be seized dorisi is not an option. You have to keep on striving and working because God is the one that providentially puts you in a particular position. And just because you have to have a thorn in your flesh does not mean he doesn't have your back. His grace is sufficient for you and his power is made perfect in your weakness. Oftentimes you tend to have been given so much favor in your upbringing, in your upcoming, that God had to um, humble you, subdue you. And you see the thing about gaining promotion without necessarily having the credentials that everybody else in the environment that you are in has, it can make you conceited. I got to a point, I guess, in my career historically, where I, I just felt I had a self-importance. It's like I I, uh, I kind of imagined that I was untouchable. Like I just kept getting all of these favors, you know, pulled in for me. People just kept on liking me so much and giving me promotions that degreed individuals were passed up for. That I was, I basically just got to a, a space where I imagined that it was brazen for people to think that I could ever start lowly or from scratch or work a job that's frankly not managerial or you get my point like clout how dare you think i could ever live without clout was the mindset that i low-key had and for very many years i frankly kind of low-key still kept all the way up until literally as recently as like a week ago realizing that God kept a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, that I might not be conceited. To sit around, having the skills set of Jacob, Jesus, Joseph, David, Paul, and therefore be like, ah, don't you see that I am to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Who do you think you are to leave me in so a lowly position as this? Eh, God will keep that thorn there. He will keep it, and you will end up from a very lowly position. Preach what you were supposed to preach to the Gentiles. Right much of the new testament but with a thorn chilling in your flesh but you don't have an option to not write the new testament you don't have a choice to not be the best that god will have you be the job that god has for you you must still do it but the, you will do it with a thorn you will get your wife rachel you will get your wife rachel or your rachel opportunity if you want to call it that but first you must endure leah you are going to have to work for seven years extra to get the thing that you've always wanted anyway you don't have an option to let go of the prospect of taking Rachel. You don't, now that they've tricked you into marrying Leah. Just settle with the fact that I guess this is my wife, Rachel, goodbye. If you love something, you work hard for it. So therefore, if you've always been ambitious, you can't let yourself be sis Doris. You can't be the breaking even lady. That's out you're working the same job for 40 years. Not bothering anybody, with nobody finding them triggering, with nobody finding them intimidating. You don't get to be scared of everything so much that now you will be complacent because on that day God is going to tell you wicked and slothful servant depart from me. I never knew you. Bind you, hand and foot, throw you into the utter darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and in that place the smoke of your torment rises up forever and there is no rest for you day and night. You will endure calamity, calamities and consequences for basically trying to protect yourself from being Daniel in the lion's den again. If you try to protect yourself from being part of uh, King Joseph and the Potiphar's wife again, running from licentious men with me i have got a real big problem with men that felt entitled to me that used corobella and were like uh, you're not gonna be fine Karam. this is tit for tat nothing is for mahala just so you don't have to deal with another part of his house not again and just so you don't have to deal with another part of his wife sorry you then don't work so hard ne? you then don't work so hard that Potiphar will see that whoa what a wonderful slave and then put you head of over all of the affairs of his household and so therefore as a result of being in front of all of his affairs catch the eye of his lustful female the only reason why joseph caught the eye of potiphar's wife was because he was made head slave he was put in potiphar's quarters he was made important given some kind of prestige and esteem as a slave until potiphar's wife considered him something to bite into like a snack and she then seduced him if Joseph was mediocre, breaking even, if he was Brother Doris or Brother Derrick, the dude that's always working in the mail room in your company for 20 years and does not ask for a promotion, does not try to study more, does not try to do that he's enough. 
and that's all that he's content with. He's been driving the same car for 20 years and really, he's okay. The dude is breaking even. Yeah. He could have been Bra Braderick. Joseph could have been, been Braderick. And if Joseph saw it fit to keep himself as U Braderick, part of his wife would not have been all up in there. Like Papa, she wouldn't have. The slaves tend to be young where when they start working. They have to have the vigor to, you know, do all that hard knock labor. So they are muscular, they are handsome, they're beautiful. They're, they're wonderful looking young men. That's what I'm getting at. Slaves. So they were basically more where they came from. What Joseph looked like likely was more where they came from. There was likely more where they came from. There were other slaves all up in that joint that probably was were as handsome, if not more handsome, than Joseph. But the one that caught Potiphar's wife's eye was the one that was important to Potiphar. The one that was elevated, the one that was... um promoted because he was the best one in terms of his work ethic he was intelligent he could read he could uh, he was a bit of an architect at heart that's who it is that, that joseph was and so all that skills set mixed with all of that handsome boy the, those handsome boyish looks part of his wife was like yo this is up for grabs i'm taking it joseph could have been bro Derek, the handsome bro Derek that just is allowing himself to what is the word that i'm looking for retire in the mail room and literally just go unnoticed slipped through the cracks he could have done that and part of his wife would have left him alone he would have been maintained in godliness but god would have been disappointed in his lack of pulling of his weight and the promise of god would not have been fulfilled listen up the dude was supposed to rescue all of israel what you intended for evil god intended for good the saving of many lives he was supposed to rescue the people of god that christ might ultimately be born somewhere in the future he had that big job david joseph sorry could not drop that ball he had to be as good as he was and in being as good as he was he would inevitably then attract Potiphar's wife. He would inevitably attract Potiphar's wife. You have to be good enough to be made head slave by Potiphar. But in so being good enough, you will also attract Potiphar's wife's lust. I wanted to be Bro Derek, or in this instance, Sis Doris. Seeing as I'm a woman, I wanted to be Sis Doris, you guys. I thoroughly made a decision to be Sis Doris. Because I attract rubbish attention all up in my grill again. There are plenty of beautiful women littered across corporate South Africa that don't get given grief by men because they slip through the cracks. They merely exist. They come in and they go every single day. They just yawnfully exist and that's it. And they don't get pursued by licentious CEOs and general managers and all different kinds of men that are out here trying to give women promotions in exchange for sex. I spoke about it the other day. How it is that a lot of times these women that end up sleeping their way to the top, they tend to not need, they, they tend to not have needed to do that. Because the only reason why these men would even be in a position to offer them a promotion was because they were, uh, uh, what, what is this, uh, good enough. A lot of times these women tend to be good enough to do those jobs. They tended to have been excellent enough to do those jobs. They were qualified enough to do those jobs. These men saw that. That's what they were drawn to. Their work ethic, that the fact that they look so good doing what they do. They, they are not just the pretty receptionist girl that's sitting there like a log from the age of 18 up until 27 in the same job they are the person springboarding up the ladder really just working hard to try and shift the paradigm and that is what they find attractive they are joseph they are beautiful and skilled hardworking and ambitious and that's the kind of thing that's going to cause a woman to be like lay with me i like you otherwise known as a man being like lay with me i like you you get spotted by the GM, by the CEO, you get spotted by the senior manager, by your own boss as meat for the consumption, precisely because you're that good at what you do. You get promised promotions in exchange for sex because those jobs indeed are already yours. Those jobs are indeed fit for purpose for you. Your skills are already girthy. You are already able to do that job. You don't have to sleep with this man. But like, he will insist that in order for you to maintain your position or even get a better one, you're going to have to sleep with him. You tend to already have it going down for yourself. That's what I'm getting at. I, I literally, I did a video the other day speaking about how it is that women don't squander yourselves, don't squander your virtue when you are a deserving of a job promotion and you're going to get one, but not first before squandering your virtue. Somebody else will notice you without first insisting upon your body because bottom line is you deserve it. You do. So what's the point of what's with the sex? Like, why, why, where does that fit in? It's just like an unnecessary added extra. It's a value add or a, or a value less add. It's just uh, like a syntax. It's just, I don't know. It's just extra meat. It's fluff. It's like maverick spent. It's unnecessary. It's entirely unnecessary. Yeah. How? So I wanted to avoid more Potiphar's wives 
because whether or not I'm beautiful is irrelevant. There are many beautiful women that don't endure sharp fangs, teeth, from silly men in corporate, because they just go unnoticed. They go unnoticed. They come into the office and they go home, and that's it. They, there's plenty of them. It, my beauty was never the issue. Joseph could not have been the only handsome slave in Egypt. Is that basic? It was the skill. So I told myself that if I just fly under the radar, barely noticeable, maybe a bleep, but then again, a negligible one because I'm bleeping right next to a collected cloud, like cloud of, of, of like uh, dots on this particular um, uh, 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 Cartesian plane. I am scattered here in this concentrated clump of dots with so many other people that I'm going to just go unnoticed. Go unnoticed. Like just go unnoticed. Then ain't nobody gonna be out to be like, lay with me or else. Yeah. Okay, oh. had to charge my phone. I'm bad now. Yes, so when you're dealing with the... Uh, what is this case? I wanted to make like Mama Doreen. Mama Dorisi or whatever. I gave her the name. I wanted to make like her so that I don't end up like Joseph in Potiphar's household again. I was tired of bad men. And I... Uh, well, was, am. I'm tired of bad men and I'm also tired. Bad exploitative men. And I'm also exhausted from just sabotage. Nje, where it, like in whatever shape, form or uh, color it might come i'm just exhausted plus i am like i said i get dreams i get visions uh, the law shows me what what in the world um is going on coupled with the scriptures looking around and i i saw or i see that we're close to the end if not at the very end and so because it's the end i was like just hunker down until christ comes for the bride just hunker down until the rapture hunker down and then the lord made it clear that laziness is not of my kingdom so this entire uh session of communication really i entered into it for the sake of encouraging uh, people who have been brought low to help you understand that okay we are here on the earth to fill it and to occupy and God does not want us be la being lax and lazy. And Christians cannot be cursed, guys. Even if people think we can be. The occult only keeps on trying because they think they are succeeding. We are never cursed. We, we are only endured through trials and tribulations. The trials and tribulations of which God guaranteed would come. He made it clear that in this world you're going to have much trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. The world hates disciples. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. They will throw you at the synagogues. You're going to lose mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, homes, fields. Um, and just a year. Yeah. And however, you're going to gain a hundredfold over all that which you have lost. Mark 10. Uh, with persecutions, with persecutions, and in the next life, uh, eternal life, that's what you're going to gain. So we are told that we are going to endure a lot. We must count the cost of being disciples. We know that we are going to endure a lot, lot, lot. Uh, so therefore, when we do go through it, we're not cursed. We can't be. Uh, and I spoke about that yesterday, that our blessedness is not, uh, it's not gauged by material success or prosperity it's gauged by our piety our holding fast to a holy god that has given us precepts to live by and when we successfully conquer darkness in order to overwhelm uh our fear that's true prosperity that's true prosperity and in due season after you have suffered like this god will tend to restore you if anything last night i was going through so so very much uh like this thing that that, that ended up that caused me to end up thinking these thoughts where it is that i was thoroughly thinking of becoming mama